Because with comics, you've got your real estate from the very beginning. If you're told it's a 22 page story, that's all you have. You can't mm. do 21 pages. You can't do 23. You can't just bounce around. And more importantly, you get other restraints. Hey, it's Joe Solari, and we're on the business of writing. And today our guest is Tony Lee. Welcome, Tony. Thanks for having me, Joe. So met in Madrid, and I heard you speak. I think you did two, two speeches there, right? Yeah, I was brought in to do one. And then the, fo the following day that I was brought, uh, they said there's been a... Basically, Craig Martell had double booked himself. <laughs> okay. And there was a spare spot. And people had come up over the Saturday and said, oh, is there any more going on? And he just said, can you do another one? And I had enough slides to cobble something else together. So, yeah, so te technically it was two, but it was more sort of one and a half. Yeah, yeah. And it was great. <clears throat> it was one of the things that I was really uh, impressed with the material you're providing. I thought it was pretty original and help. you could tell it was helping a lot of people. So I wanted to have you on because of the whole idea of this, while I'm very focused on authors creating these great businesses, if you have a crappy product, you can't have a business. So I think you've got some really cool ideas on how you can make better products. So why don't we start out with you just telling a little bit about yourself and how you got into this game. And I know you've been in a lot of different media and help people understand the context of where you're coming from. Yeah, absolutely. It's really weird, actually, because I think I was saying this to you at Madrid. Madrid was my first 20 books conference because I've actually only been writing independently published books since 2020, since the pandemic. Before that, I was writing in traditional media. I was writing in sort of comics, film, TV, audio, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> And I've had this kind of very strange journey. It's one of these things where people have said to me in the past, how do I write like you? And I say to them, don't, because the journey I've had, I would not wish on anybody. Because I'm 52 years old and I've been writing professionally for probably about 35 of those. My first job was actually games reviewing when I was 16 years old, when I was still at school. Now we're talking back in the 80s. So I was reviewing Sinclair Spectrum games on tape. And it was purely done because I was in sixth form, which is, for the Americans who don't know, it's between the ages of 16 and 18. It's when <clears throat> we were doing our A-levels and things like that. Okay. And I had work experience. And at the time, I wanted to work in computers, which was very much a, a blossoming industry. And there was no work experience I could get. I couldn't intern anywhere because the companies didn't exist. And in the end, because I played Spectrum games, I just phoned up one of these companies that wrote magazines that did this and said, hey, can I do some work experience for two weeks? And that was literally it. And they said, sure, why not? I turned up, they gave me a couple of tapes to play. And I started doing that. And I ended up doing that for the entirety of my time. They kept me on, they paid me. And I kept writing all the way through college. <clears throat> and college in the UK was up to 18 for me. I didn't okay. go to university. And then once I'd finished with that, I moved on. And I learned my first rule, which was you don't have to know everything or have like great degrees and things like this. It's more what you know or where you've been. So I was walking into magazines and saying, hello, I'd like to write for you. <clears throat> and they were looking at me and going, what do you do? And I would show them these magazines I'd done. So having this portfolio would help me. Yeah. So learning very quickly that what I had was better than what I could do pushed me into that area. And then I got paralyzed when I was 20. I was a Covent Garden street performer. 2021, I had an accident and for six months I couldn't really walk. I was regaining going through physical therapy, but it meant I had to find work that worked from home. And so I was doing sketch comedy for Radio 4, just little small second sketches for a topical news quiz. And I started to learn about deadlines because with the games, I would have this issue where they would say to me, hey, here's a game, go play it. We need a review in, say, three weeks. Mm -hmm. With the sketch comedy, I was going in on Tuesday and they were saying, we need this by Thursday because we're recording on Friday. So I, it, my world started coming down. And from that, I started moving into other areas. I became a local journalist for one of my local papers. And I worked on the features desk and I worked with local theatres and stuff like that. But that was where my second sort of thing came in, where I realized that I was no longer looking at deadlines, which were days. I was looking at deadlines, which were hours. I'd turn around on deadline day and the editor would go, we've got three inches that we need to fill by five o'clock. 
<laughs> go find something. And so I learned again how to get in there quickly, how to write fast, how to build it up. And the one thing I always say to anybody who comes up to me and says, I want to be a writer, how do I do it? The first thing I always say is, go do a journalism course. Because that shit teaches you to type fast. You mm. learn quickly how to get what you need down. And then I carried on that. I moved into radio and things like that. And I did say there was 35 years of this. <laughs> <laughs> but then when I was in my 30s, I had an opportunity to work, to go and visit DC and Marvel when they were both in, in New York. And because I'd got this radio and newspaper background and I'd created campaigns and I'd written scripts, I was able to show them that I could do the things. And again, I'm back to that. I had things to show. Yeah. And they gave me an opportunity. Marvel gave me a shot to do an X-Men story. Having the X-Men in my hand then meant I could go to other people and pitch other things. And then I was writing Doctor Who and Battlestar Galactica and Star Trek. And I did a MacGyver story, which was, for me, one of the greatest moments of my life as a massive <laughs> MacGyver fan. <clears throat> and that then pushed me into TV. That then pushed me into film, into audio dramas. And I just found myself in this entire area. Mm -hmm. And I'm working on one side with collaborations. On another side, I'm looking at just sitting in a room on my own. And then the pandemic happened and everything died like in a day just went mm. TV and film stopped comic shops closed. Everything I did just went into limbo and a few months into it, I didn't know what to do. And a friend of mine, a guy called Andy Briggs suggested I speak to a mutual friend of ours, which is a chap called Barry Hutchinson, who used to write children's books around the same time I did. And I'm sure you Barry well as yeah. well. He writes under the name JD Kirk and he was kind enough to sit down and explain what he did. And I realized that this was something that could possibly save my life. And I don't mean financially, because with nothing to write, I was going crazy. I had mm. no outlet to think of where to go. And so I started writing crime novels. And I have a love of crime. I that sounds bad. I have a love <laughs> of crime stories. I have a love of the TV shows and things like that. I read the books. I had crime TV show pitches that had never happened, which I was able to take and rub oh, the serial numbers off and turn them into stories but what it did is it gave me the opportunity to get myself out there and play around with some new ideas and just do something that was freedom and for me I wasn't relying on someone else to decide when they were going again it was for myself and so I started writing as Jack Gatland and this was literally two years ago last week because it was the end of September 2020. Wow. So your career was fast and financially successful quickly. Absolutely. I was an overnight success at 50. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's always the case, right? In your case, you were doing a lot of that work outside of novels, right? For a lot yeah. of authors, that work is inside. They may write for 10 years and then they find their voice and they find that yeah. series and maybe a pen name that takes off for them. And nobody remembers the seven years or 10 years before that. They're just like, but so yours yeah. was just in a different, it was in different industries. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I was writing stories when I was in my 20s. I was just writing, sorry, I was writing novels when I was in my 20s. I was writing, I mean, I had a book, Dodge and Twist, which was a sequel to Oliver Twist, which was a, a graphic novel. And then I turned it into a, an actual novel itself about 10 years ago and put it up on Kindle before I, I even realized what self-publishing was, mm. purely to keep it as an IP because someone was trying to steal it. So I was writing novels. I just, I had a really big problem with writing novels. And it's the one thing in a way that's made me more of a success than I think I should be. Because mm. my one problem was, is I hated writing descriptions. Absolutely hated it because I'd spent years writing very short things like newspaper articles or 30 second adverts. And then I went into comics where if I want to do something descriptive, I just tell the artist what to draw. Or if I'm doing a film or TV, the director would just put me aside and say, don't worry, kid, I've got this. Yeah. So I never really had to look into how to do these amazing, flowing, descriptive scenes, which I love as a reader, but I just could not do. Which meant that when I started writing my books, I had to fall back on my knowledge of comics and the cliffhanger and how to get things going. And what that meant was I was pushing a lot more things into my books. The average mm. murder has, the average crime story has someone is murdered, they find out who did it, they are just, uh, it's done. I was averaging three or four deaths a book because I'd get halfway through the book and didn't kill someone randomly because the book was getting boring. And nine times out of ten, I'd killed the murderer, so I now had to rewrite the book. <laughs> but, 
but I had to keep it going. And because I was keeping it going, it meant it became one of these books where people were going, I can't put it down. Yeah. Because they had the same franticness in reading as I had in writing, if that makes so, sense. What, so the interesting thing you brought up there that I'd like to do a deeper dive on. Here you are, you identify this personal weakness of, I'm not really good at descriptions. How did you resolve it? How did you overcome that? What was the process of thinking back on that now? Honestly, I don't know if I have. And I'm being okay. completely honest. No, that's there. cool. I think part of my concern was that I'd basically given myself a very high bar because I read books that I'm very passionate about. And some of these books are incredible. And then I also read books that are pulp. My favorite books in the entire world, and I read them every year, are Roger Zelazny's Nine Princes in Amber, which mm. they're, they're bite sized books. I grew up reading Terence Dix's Doctor Who novelizations, his Target books. And again, they were bite-sized books. They got you into the action as quick as possible. They didn't really push the descriptive side. And then you can sit down and read Lord of the Rings and you're a thousand words in before Tom Bombadil's even turned up. So there's yeah. an element of there's two sides of this. And I was always trying to go towards the arty side, the Booker Prize winning side, the Pulitzer side, when really all I needed to do was, in my mind, write what I call a three-star book. Mm. Because... The plan I realized I was doing is I was writing books and bringing them out at a cost that was probably about a third to a half the size of the average book. And my mentality was I had to match that book, whereas actually I didn't have to. I could write a lesser book because I wasn't in my mind at the start. I was thinking I'm writing a lesser book because I'm giving lesser cost, etc. What that did is it took the stress away. And it allowed me to go, do you know what? I can enjoy writing this book now. And because I enjoyed it and I got behind it, I started to really get into the book and I wrote it better because I cared about it. If that makes sense. <laughs> it does. And it I does. think on the, re on the sort of how did I get better side, one, I wrote a million words of Jack Gatland. And by that point, I think I got a little bit better. But at the same time, one of my things was, is the research. And it's something that a lot of people don't get is, when people start writing their books, they start researching stuff and they go, I'm going to research this poison and that's going to be what I use. I don't do that. I'll pick a location it's going to be and I'll research the location. I'll research the buildings. I'll research something that I found out about it because that could be important. But also that research will then give me more information to put in the book. And weirdly, this comes back from when I was a games reviewer. And I actually, it's one of the reasons I stopped being a games reviewer, because my last game I did was a, was a game called, I'll always remember it, which was called Mr. Weems and the She Vampires. And I can't tell you if it was a good or bad game because I never played it because the tape died. Because in those days, it was like a yeah, cassette tape yeah. put in and, and loaded. If there's anybody here who doesn't understand how this works, who's too young to understand, I hate you. But basically, you had this cassette, you put it in, it loaded onto a computer, and the cassette had chewed up. And I'd contacted your Sinclair magazine and said, I can't play the game. What do I do? It's got to be with you in a week and a half. And they said, there's nothing we can do about this. We can't get the game to you in time. You're just going to have to make it up. You're just going to have to guess. And I couldn't do that. I was, too, I was 17 years old. I didn't want to do this. And I ended mm. up, I was. this is before emails. This is before fax. This is before websites. I was phoning up the company and asking them to read out the press release to me down the line. I was checking in magazines that had come out like two days before I was to send it off because they might have had an early review and gaining screenshots and stuff like that. Mm. And using all this review and put together, I was able to create this fictional review of a game that fitted all the buttons. And actually, people said it was one of my best reviews, which is concerning. But what it showed me was <laughs> active research can give you a yeah. knowledge that is artificial. So when I do my books, Declan Walsh, my detective, is in the city of London. So a lot of the places they go to have reasons why they're there or there's history behind them. So I talk about this. At the end of my books, I'll explain a little bit more about these places. But because I'm doing this, because I'm researching this, it gives me the confidence to describe it better. Mm. If that makes sense. No, it does. It does. Because you, you start to get immersed in that, right? Yeah, absolutely. So 
would you consider yourself a pantser or a plotter or something in between? Like, yes. how do you think about your process right now? It evolves depending on the book. Okay. And this is actually one of the things I talk about when I do the talk itself is because from comics. OK, so the easiest thing to explain very quickly, comics is the hardest medium in the world to write. And people might look at me at this point and go, come on, it, five year olds read it. That's rubbish. But you can write a book that's 100,000 words or 200,000 words. Or if you're J.K. Rowling, 1,200 words. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be 1,922 words. It's completely irrelevant. The chapters can be whatever number you want because the chapter mm -hmm. ends, you turn the page, it's a new chapter. It doesn't matter what it is. If you write a film, that film script can be 90 pages, 100 pages. Again, it doesn't matter. The editor will change it. If it's a TV show that has to be a set length, That'll be done in the edit. Aaron Sorkin's scripts were 65 pages long for yeah, effectively a 40 minute show. And with audio drums, all these things, you can go as much as you want because it's only in the editing process, in the fixing process, does this become important. But with comics, you can't because with comics, you've got your real estate from the very beginning. If you're told it's a 22 page story, that's all you have. You can't mm. do 21 pages. You can't do 23. You can't just bounce around. And more importantly, you get other restraints. If you have a massive reveal or a shock, it has to be on the left-hand page. Because when you read a book, you read the book, you turn it over, you carry on. But when you read a comic, you're going down to the bottom right. And as you turn and scroll up, the visual pictures will instantly hit your subconscious. So if you have uh... a massive surprise on the right-hand side, you might bypass it, but it's there. And as you read, it's there. And it's like the person sitting next to you in the cinema who's tapping you a second before things happen and telling you what's going on. So now you know that your big surprises have to be on the left-hand side. You've only got, say, 22 pages. And the first and the last page have to be big, ex expansive, what happened last time or what will happen next time pages. Which means that when you're writing a story, you have to work your way backwards because you have to go, OK, my finale is this and it's going to take five pages. My beginning scene is going to be about four pages. So now I know I've done nine pages. So now I've got 13 pages in the middle I've got to work in and I've got these four things that need to happen. So now you're plotting it. But then when you've written out your 22 pages and you go, shit, page 13 should be on page 12. Mm -hmm. So now I've got to get rid of a page. But then that changes everything after. Or I've got to add a page, and then that changes everything. And that's where the plotting side comes in. So as a writer, you find yourself doing this. But the more comics you write, the better you get at it. Mm. And you find ways to get around it. So for me, I would come up with a cliffhanger. Because the cliffhanger would be the moment that I wanted to give a shit about. I wanted to build to this moment. And then I'd work backwards. And I'd work backwards to the beginning. And then once I had the beginning, I could then carry on to the end. So I'd come in about two thirds of the way through, go back to page one and then carry on the other way. But what that took was I was still pantsing because I had no idea what was going on. I wasn't mm -hmm. plotting, but I was just sitting there in a room asking myself questions. Marion is being hanged by the sheriff of Nottingham. Why? Because she's helped Robin Hood. Why? Because he's asked her to commit treason. Why? All these things ask yourself back. Marion wouldn't just do this for someone she met. So she has to have a history with him. Oh, tick that's something i can look into all yeah. these things build up so when i'm writing a book there's an element of pantsering because i'm writing a crime story and my stories are very much the detectives learning as they go along but at the same time i have to know where i am i have to know what the murderer is i don't have to know who the murderer is not what the murderer is who the murderer is what's going on with it the problem i have is because of the way i've written over the years I've tried it where I've actually, I've started the novel and I've written the denouement scene, the Poirot, you wonder why I've gathered you all here scene. <laughs> and I can guarantee you that by the time I get to that scene, I have to rewrite it because three of the people in that scene are dead. Because okay. during the story, something will come out from left field. My subconscious will throw out a curveball that I go, oh shit, that works. Yeah, And suddenly everything has to change. And so therefore the pantsering side is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, but I will still plot it, but on a very loose framework. I use plotter and okay. I'll put, I've got five lines on my plotter. So I have one, which is, this is what's going to be going on in my story. I'll have the hero's journey, the 12 step mystery journey, and probably one of the other ones just so I can go, okay, so what should I be doing around now? Okay. 
this says this, and this says this. Yeah, I'm going to go kill someone. Okay, Mike, that's good. Let's <laughs> And that's well, how I find myself writing, because doing it that way seems to work. And one thing I have learned, and I'm on 12 Declan Walsh books have come out now. And on those books, the one thing I have found is my audience don't give a shit about the murders. They don't care. They mm-hmm. want to see what happens to the characters. If I threaten to kill any of my characters, they go ballistic at me. Yeah. And most of murder fans are terrifying 65-year-old women who live in either England, Australia, or America. I'm not going to piss any of them off. No, they can write you every day, all day. Well, also, right. they read all the books that know how to yeah. kill. So. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting, because I think with the genre that you write, there's, like, the experience that what they're really looking for is they want to feel throughout the whole thing that they've got it figured out before the detective character does. And then when it does get revealed, and it's not what they thought, and they go back and look at page one, and they see, oh, my God, it was there the whole time. How did I miss that? This author smarter than me. There's this whole kind of intellectual game you're playing with your reader. That's where I think what you're doing is so interesting because I think a lot of authors think they have to be that smart from the beginning, right? Yeah, and this is something I've spoke to many people about over the years because you only need to give a damn about your book the day it's read. When you're writing mm. that book, you can go back and you can change it. We're no longer in the days where you have to write it longhand and there's barely any paper around, so you've got to be careful. We can cut and paste. We can move things around. We can change it as we want. And one of the things I've... And I've been doing this, and again, I was going back to an example. I was doing a Doctor Who crossover. Not crossover, six-part series. And we had to go to the BBC and tell them what we were doing. It was a 10th Doctor story. And it was great. And we got it going. And we got to episode five. And I realized as episode five was written and sent into the BBC that on TV, the episode of Doctor Who that had just come on destroyed everything we'd done because we'd gone in a direction that Russell T. Davis had also gone in. And we were like, why didn't you tell us? And the BBC were like, we didn't want to spoil it for you. And we were like, well, that's great. But now you've destroyed our story because our story now cannot work. But we had a situation where book one, part one had come out. Part two was about to go to print. Part three was being lettered. Part four was being drawn. Part five had just been scripted. And so in the space of a weekend, I had to work out a completely new finale, a completely new act three and a new bad guy and what was going on. But in the process, I was able to go back into part two and change some lines and part three and do something else so that when people are reading this book they're going this is stupid this is supposed to be a martha story and he's got donna being mentioned this guy doesn't know doctor who and it was only when book five came out or part five came out that people went oh okay that's why you're doing this Mm. but the only reason i was able to do this was because i'd written it and this is why chekhov's gun is the greatest thing in the world because Chekhov's gun is the thing that sort of says, if you see it in Act 1, it's got to go off by Act 3. But you don't have to put it in in Act 1. You can actually get to Act 3 and then decide you need it and then go put it in Act 1. The greatest example of this is Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. They're in jail. And they're, how do we get out of here? And they go, when we get out of here, let's take the key and we'll come back in time and we'll put it there. And they go and look and it's there. And then they open the door and then they go, now we've got to go back in time and put it there because they didn't, it's the easiest way possible to do it, but it's the exact thing that all writers can do. So I will get to the end and I will write things. When I literally, I've just finished my second Daily Reckless book and there's parts at the end where I'm thinking, I haven't explained how they know this. And I'll go back through the scene and realize, oh, actually in chapter three, there's a moment where somebody writes something, they could match the handwriting. Okay, that's cool. Um, And now I've got them going, oh, well, in in Act 3, this happened. And now I look clever. And there have been some very happy accidents. I have had people contact me and go, oh, my God, I can't believe you you gave us this massive clue in the person's surname. And Mm. I hadn't clicked. The only reason I'd used the surname was because it was actually a character from Doctor Who. It was literally, and I'm like, oh, I hadn't even realized that this was such a thing. Yeah, that's like with game designers and yeah, the, the Aprophenia comes in and people like 
put all kinds of meaning on stuff that actually wasn't there. And you're like, yeah, of course I meant that. I'm very impressed with anybody who reckons they can work out who the killer was in my books, because even I didn't know. Letter from the Dead, I have a character who dies two thirds of the way through, and it's my first one, and he was the killer. And I had to go back and rewrite things to fit it so that obviously he isn't a killer. And it was a good idea he was killed because I had a better idea. But I had people going, oh, I could tell from the start. And it was like, oh, really? Yeah, well done on you. You guessed. <laughs> you, you flipped a coin. Any, yeah, anyone yeah. can flip that coin. Yeah. Is Do you have like a process when you're this, doing this? this? To... Hang on. Sorry, there's a really bad beeping outside. But yeah, so I was I had a Goodreads review on one of my books where they said you know, I was very unhappy that this, I worked out who did this, who did the murder on page seven, and it was this person. And I had to reply and go, it wasn't. You were supposed to think that. Yeah. But if you'd finished the book, <laughs> you would have seen it with somebody else. <laughs> and that's what I want. One of the things I do get is a lot of people say, you need to have a piece of paper and a pen when you read a Jack Gatlin book, because there's so many things going on, you can't remember. But then at the same time, if I was to write a book where not as much happened, I've had people go, I didn't enjoy this book, it was boring. Yeah, yeah. Coin toss. Yeah, and I think your background coming out of these for short form media mm. d gives you some strengths that other folks might not have because the consumers of books are having shorter and shorter attention spans. They're just used to get yeah. And I, my biggest example of this is I started, my kids were young and I was like, oh, I'm going to read Lord of the Rings to them. And you start reading it and it's not the experience I had when I was in middle school reading that book and how amazing it was. Yeah. It's like, wow, this thing is slow. And I was just skipping over chapters because I was bored and I just knew they certainly were going to be bored. You skipped over Four Naked Hobbits and Tom Bombadil, <laughs> didn't you? Like that, it's That was the point I would stop every time I tried to read that book. I'd hit Four Naked Hobbits and Tom Bombadil and go, I don't even know where this book is going. Yeah. But by the time I got to book two, I was happy. Yeah. So I think that that's just culturally how the world's changing. Right? We just have, we've had higher quality, more intense products delivered. So we're getting, that's what we want. Do you, have you figured out a process? Like how, do you have like steps that you kind of work through when you're doing this oh, working yes. backwards? Thing? One of the reasons I was able to do my talks at Madrid was because I actually do a one or sometimes two day course for Rain Dance, which is a British film festival. And okay. I do screenwriting talks and I talk about how everything goes. <clears throat> and I had a long conversation with somebody when I first started because I looked at it and thought, I'm pantsing my books and going, I like the idea of a murder in a murder in a nunnery. So let's go do a murder in a nunnery. But I had no idea why I would do this or how this would work. But when I was writing a comic, I was planning it out. I was meticulously doing page by page. I literally, I would come up with the idea, I would write the synopsis, I would break it into scenes, I'd break those scenes into pages, I'd break those pages into panels, and only then would I write the script. But with a book, I would just get page one. Once upon a time, there was. And it was where I was failing, because when I was a kid, I was always taught, never write a book with once upon a time. Always start with, put the gun down, she said, or something like that. Yeah. Throw somebody in at the start. So over time, I'd created my own kind of area of doing this and fun enough using plotter has actually helped a lot as well because i couldn't get my because of the way that my books work and i've learned now i do have to be organic with the way i do this i can't hammer out what's going to happen in the story because i know that by the time i get to fifty thousand words it's going to completely change and what i find works for me now is i block my chapters down to about two and a half thousand words each chapter i have about 26 to 30 chapters in a book so depending on sizes and things like that i don't punish myself if i go over or under i keep to that kind of style i give myself a set word count per day and i hold everything in a program called notion which is oh, like yeah i'm familiar with notion it's awesome it's, it's it's my second brain and I have everything in there. I have a database that has all my projects, where I am. You can click on my project line and it comes up with a page where I have literally the word count, the percentage, where I am, the list of all the things I have to do, any ideas I come up with over the time, I'll put them in here, anything like that. All my ideas brain gets thrown into here. And I use Todoist, which is a, a to-do app. And if I'm walking the dog, I can just tap on my phone and go, this is what I want. And it will put it into to do this because when I walk my dog, that's when I'm just letting myself Ooh. go. I'm just thinking yeah. myself out. And what I'll often do is I'll find myself, I can't narrate books. I can't do what someone like my, uh, Stephen Higgs will do where he'll just sit there just talking and that's the book. I can do dialogue though. 
So I'll be working through a scene, just talking into my phone. And then when I get home, I've got 2000 words of just random gibberish. But once I've put it into the book and added all the he said, she said, then I've got myself a scene that works <clears throat> or I'm got coming it. through. <clears throat> so what I'll find I'll do is I'll start with the idea of the story. I'll gain what I want to do with it, where I want to go, what characters I want to focus on. Is this a Declan story? Is this a DCI Monroe story? Is this going to be somebody else? Who am I bringing back into the story from previous books? What am I going to do here? And I use a lovely woman called Diane Garland, World Keeper, who takes my books and turns them into these amazing OneNote spreadsheets. So I can go back and look at all my old books and click on each character and see what they've done in the past. So I can go, oh, they were left doing that. Brilliant. I'll do that. Then I start putting the story together. At this point, the second most important thing happens. I have to work out the title. I cannot write a book if I don't know the title at mm. all. It just my brain just goes. I have to sit down and go, OK, this is what it's going to be called. So I know, for example, my next book is going to be called Murder by Mistletoe. The one after that is going to be called Beneath the Bodies. I know, you know, all the names have to be done. I have to visualize what the cover is going to look like. Now, granted, I'm rapid releasing every few months. So I'm as I'm finishing book, this book, I'm advertising this book. I've got to have this ready to go onto Amazon. So there's an element to making sure I have that. But I find that having the title, having the cover gives me that moment where I can go, right, this is where I go. So I work out what the death is, and I'll always have an establishing death in the prologue. I'll then have a scene involving the characters, and then I'll start working through it. I then put this into Plotter, and I start working through in Plotter where I'm going to have the big beats. Then when I'm comfortable with that, I start writing, and I'll write a percentage of num words per day. And if I find that I'm getting stuck, I will swap projects. I will write a fantasy novel. I will write a comic. I will do something else. And then I'll come back to it. I will get my limit, my targets done every day. Then when I get, and every book is about 80,000 words. And when I get to about 50,000 words, I go back to the start. Literally, I go back to the start and I start on page one again. And I just go through every single page again. And what I'm doing at this point is one, I'm remembering the story. Because at this point, I've probably been writing for a couple of weeks now. And I've just got to remember where I am. But also some of the things I started the story with have now changed. <laughs> I've now decided that so-and-so is a secret brother or so-and-so was doing this or someone else is now the main culprit or I've even included someone new. So now I have to go back and make sure these people are in the earlier scenes or there's something else. But what this also does is by the time I get to the 50,000 word stage again, I'm on about 55 to 60,000 words. So I've progressed past it and now I'm into the final act and now I'm on the roll and I'm ready to go and I know where I'm hitting. And then once I'm done, I go back to the beginning and I start again. And once more, because by the time I get to the denouement, I will probably have changed some things again. And I go back to the beginning, I'll go through everything all over again. I'll go through pro writing aid and go through some stuff. And then I send it to my editing team, who does three of them. Once my editing team has it and they come back to me with their changes, I will play around with it. Then I'll send it to my beta team. One of my editors is there purely for story. And they've come back to me before and said, this would not happen. This character would not do this. So now I have to go and rewrite that character, which then also uh, means going back throughout the book to throw things in. Or it could be, I need another reason why this character does this so I could go mm. back and do this. But because I'm going back and going back, it gives me that opportunity to do that. Also, I do a lot of things when I'm writing my first draft where I'll get to a point and I don't know it and I'll go square bracket, XX square bracket, and then carry on. Because I know that if I just search that, I can find that at any point. And that will be my, I'll do that later moment. And then when I get to the end of it, I can then research that and find out what that is and get that going. For example, in a book I've just done, I've been learning about how to take gold and basically effectively reduce it into a liquid and then bring it back to being gold with aqua, aqua regia and stuff like that. And I've had to learn all these like various chemical things and stuff like that. But I had to make sure I didn't screw it up because I know that if I did, somebody would go, actually, I think you'll find it's actually chlorophonic acid that does that and not what you did. Now you've ruined my entire reading experience. <laughs> so there's that element of making sure that's all important, but I don't need that when I'm writing the book. You just type magic water stuff and just carry on because mm -hmm. that's something I can do later or even hire someone to work out what I need to do. Good point, yeah, yeah. Because so many people I know get so bogged down with the story 
because they're trying to subconsciously find ways to not write the stick. Uh, when... Find a way that takes them out of doing it. Oh, I, I can't do this bit because I've got to find this out. Or I had somebody the other day who turned around to me and said, I've had to totally rewrite my story because the Queen died. And mm. I went, oh, is the Queen in your story? And they went, no, but there's a one point they sing the national anthem. And I said, why can't it just be God save our King? And they're like, oh, yeah, but then I'm absolutely dating when the book is. And I was just like, you've got a smartphone in it, so we know it's not the 80s. Yeah. And so how far do you go on that? They were looking for a reason to move on to something else. Yeah. I uh, segue, something that's interesting around kind of your genre and, and might be something with your marketing and kind of getting your community more involved in your grant. You probably have a lot of really smart readers that know that stuff. And you mm -hmm. could start asking them those questions. Right. If you built like a little research team, if you don't already I, have that, I actually do that. I actually have a, I have a readers group, which is filled with people that can help. But what I actually, one of the things I will say, and it's not so much on that side, but it's something I find very important. And it's something that I know people, some people don't do and they get annoyed about it. And I just do not understand why. Every now and then Jack, because obviously I write under a pen name, Jack Gatland. It's mm. now known that Tony Lee is Jack Gatland, but at the start it wasn't. And the reason I did that was because tony lee wrote comics for children and <laughs> 10 year olds and doctor who stuff and amazon would have been contacting these people and saying hey kid who likes doctor who here's a new book by tony it's about a serial killer and that would obviously <laughs> not go down well but there was another side that went if it was a completely brand new name amazon had no information on it which meant that they'd have to work on what they did have which was the type of book mm -hmm. so it would then get me a little bit better on that side <clears throat> but what I will have every now and then is someone will email Jack Gatland because I have obviously a Jack Gatland email and they will say, dear Jack, I hope you don't mind, but in the ritual for the dying, you said this, but you, I think you meant this, or you've made a spelling mistake or you've called uh, DCI Monroe DCI Marcos mm. or something like that. And I'll be like, Oh shit. Sorry. Thank you very much. And most people go, Oh God, I've made a mistake. Oh, that's just terrible. And they'll go and fix it in vellum and, and we upload it. The first thing I do is I contact them and say, would you like to be on my beta reading team? Yeah. Because you're someone who has taken the time to contact me to tell me that I've made a mistake. Not to go no, but to say, look, I don't know if anybody's told you this, but. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is, I've had 13 people go through this book and there's been like 700, you know, well, no, in depth and dead, about 6,000 reviews. And not one of them found this. So, yeah, please come on board. And I've now got a team probably about 20 people who get this book. The moment my editors are finished with it, I've set it in, in vellum, I send it to these guys and they will all come back and they will all find things that my editors didn't find. And oh, they will yeah. all find things. And I've got, so one of my editors, I wrote Sleeping Soldiers, which is my spy book, my Jason Bourne, Burn Notice kind of book. And she, she repl replaced, she read it and she came back and she was very much, look, just so you know, you've called MI5, MI5. We used to call it Box when we worked there. Now, I know she's an MBE because she's got it on her name, and I knew she was in the Navy. And then uh, the conversation back was like, how do you know this? And what do you mean when you worked there? And it turned into, actually, I was naval intelligence, and I worked with MI5, and I'm pretty much a spy. And there's this element of, I'm asking you every question I've ever got ever again. Yeah, you know, yeah. As simple yeah. as that. One of my closest friends, who actually was with me in comics, was also a vice cop and worked and moved into terrorism. So he gets a lot of phone calls from me saying, how does this work exactly? Yeah. You know, well, and you, you get things like that. So I do have that kind of thing. There's such a great part of that because to your point, rather than looking at it as these people are trying to stick it to you, what's happening is they're taking ownership of the story yes. world and they yeah, want it absolutely. to be right. Like they, they, yeah. these characters in the story world mean enough to them that they, because you know what they might do? They might, she might start suggesting it to her other spy buddies. And she doesn't want to suggest a book that might have a mistake in it. Like It's true. It's very true. It's one of the things that really annoys me the most about Amazon when they do their reviews and you get top reviews, because I don't know how it works, but if I go into one of my books, I can't remember which one it was, in England, every review on top reviews is five star, five star, five star, four star, five star. I go into the US and it literally goes one star, one star, one star, two star, one star. And I've got 6,000 reviews, eight of them are one stars. 
out of all 6,000 reviews, eight are one stars. But five of them are on my top reviews. <laughs> and it's just, but this is a similar thing. This is that case of anything that helps people get through it. And again, I'll join Facebook groups that are relevant to my industry. And I will suggest other books for people to read. I'll talk to people about stuff. And it's amazing what you can find when you talk to various people. There's also, there's you have a question on anything, there's a Facebook group. I want to know about what happens to a body if it's left in the ground. There's a Facebook group, which is concerning, but at the same time, it's still giving you <laughs> factual things. <laughs> yeah, well... You, you can gain it. In this day and age, there is no reason to have someone turn around and say, you did not research this. I know in the historical romance space, there's actually fan groups that are there to do this kind of stuff, focused mm. on particular time periods where it's like, the yeah. authors that are successful in those, they won't, they'll go to that group and be like, okay, I got a question about X or Y. And there's somebody there that's going to tell you yeah. 12 pages of content on that. <laughs> no, it's true. When I did Dodge and Twist, I had to set it. It was exactly 12 years after Oliver Twist, which was set around 1834. So I had to like have it around like 1842. I had to make sure it all fit into certain years. And at one point, one of the characters said something like, in 15 seconds, we'll go. And someone replied to me and said, we didn't, they didn't have seconds in those days. There wasn't a second hand. And it was just like, ah, okay, good to know. And then somebody else went, that's bollocks, it existed. And I'm just, then you have that problem. But no, if somebody turns around and says, I am an expert in a particular thing, and this is something you need to know, I will absolutely take that information from them. Yeah. And that stuff becomes so informative, right? Because it's maybe it did exist, but you had to be really rich to have a second hand on your watch. Yeah, exactly. That kind of stuff really gets into, I was and, talking and, to an author that was has been playing around with, she writes historical romance stuff, and she was playing around with a AI to help her build descriptions. <laughs> and it came up with tobacco, which of course, if you were in a ballroom in the Regency time, it would be reeking with tobacco, right? Yeah. But w because of our context, like we don't think about that anymore. Yeah, that, like, no, absolutely. So those are the things that, whether it's fans or some of these other tools that help you to really get those descriptions, I think that's cool. So what are some things that you really see as the qualities of a good book? And I know you're focused on the crime genre, but is there some things that maybe are specific to that? Yeah, I mean, or if you can go broader than that's even better. Yeah, this is the thing, because Jack Gatland writes crime novels, kind of Dan Brown-esque kind of novels, spy novels, because that's where I've put all those things in. I wrote The Lionheart Curse, which is, was my Dan Brown Da Vinci Code. Myself, I'm known for Doctor Who. I'm known for doing this kind of comic stuff. So with me, I do a lot of urban fantasy kind of stuff. And I'm writing that kind of thing at the moment. So I'm playing around with those kind of areas. So I am trying to keep quite broad with what I'm doing. The biggest thing I state to anybody, again, is research. Because you can have a two-star book, writing-wise. But if you can show that the research is solid and that there's an interesting story because of this... That pushes you up to a three to four star book. People can, people, it's like, for example, people can get over bad directing in a movie if the story's really good. They can get past a really bad actor yeah. if the story or the directing's really good. But if the story is really bad, you get it commented on. And even if the actors are great and the directors are good, and this is a problem that Marvel's had recently, because they've had to rewrite all their things because of COVID and everything's out of order. But all their films are getting slated because they've not really put the time in that they used to. Yeah. The yeah. story is important. People will pay attention to story. And if you are just going by the books, that causes problems. So with writing crime, yeah, you have an A to B to C. And your main character is going from A to B to C to solve the case. But in, for example, Knave of Spades, my urban fantasy I'm writing, my main character is still going from A to B to C. But they're doing it because they need to find out this particular thing that will then tell them who killed their mother. And then they will go and do this particular thing here. So they're still doing the journey. And in my Dan Brown book, they have to go for A to B to C because they're doing a treasure hunt. Everything is always a quest, no matter how basic that quest is. Going to the shops is a quest, depending on how you write it. Feeding the dog is a quest. Everything can be turned into whatever you want it to be. It depends on how detailed you want to go in that situation. I know you mentioned Plotter as a tool that you're using, and you mentioned Pro Writing Aid. Is there other stuff that you use? That, uh, a Notion? Is there anything yeah, else um, on your list? Scrivener. Uh, for years, I, as a comic writer and as a screen and TV writer, I would write with Final Draft. 
and okay. I would often use Word for my pitches and stuff like that. And I wrote my first two books in Word, Letter of the Dead and Murder of Angels, and it was painful. Word isn't the most user-friendly of things. I've never really been a massive fan of it. And I bought Scrivener many years ago purely for its corkboard setting where you can plan things out because yeah. it was pretty and it looked nice. It had a corkboard background. <laughs> it looked like a corkboard. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what do you want? And I thought, and once somebody said, oh, you ought to try Scrivener. And I started using Scrivener and it made it amazing. It was, so for me, opening Scrivener and working in Scrivener is great. I can work on anything. So it all links across into Dropbox, which I use. I have an iCloud account but iCloud doesn't sync as quickly as Dropbox does. And I need to make sure that if I turn it off here and I'm opening up my MacBook, that is pretty much instantaneous because mm. I've got to be able to bounce. If I'm picking up my phone, I can use Scrivener on my phone. I can use it on my iPad. I can use it everywhere. And what this means is if I'm sitting in the dentist, I can do 200 words mm. just on my phone. It's I might have to edit it out, but I can do this. For me... Having a processor that works, as I said, I wrote on an Amstrad. I wrote on a, you know, a, a ZX Spectrum back in the day. I've done mm. everything. I wrote on typewriters. Yeah. Hey, kids, typewriters were these amazing things that didn't have screens attached. But basically, <laughs> so for me, plotter's nice, but not necessary. I like it. It doesn't. You could just do a bit of paper. If you're doing something very epic, there's a software I use called Aeon Timeline which mm -hmm. gives you characters and timelines and you can work out where things are. And that's when I'm doing a historical thing. That's when I'll play it all through. A lot of that was used in film and TV, though, not currently in books. Editing-wise is pro-writing aid. I set things up in Vellum. For me, though, you have to work out what helps you do your job. And for me, it's I'm writing constantly. For example, I've just bought a new mechanical keyboard because I need something that makes me want to type. I want something that makes me go, typing is a joy. I don't have a standing desk because my entire desk system is all built in, but I have now a standing thing that I can put on my desk so I can put my laptop on it and stand and do some work. I can swap onto my MacBook and go to a coffee shop. All these things help me with my writing. For my covers, I use Photoshop and I'll build them all in that for my making the big cover things. For the, for the print books, I'll use Illustrator. Now I'm starting to hire people to do all this because I've got mm. to that point where I'm bringing in designers. But most of the software I'm using is just the basic stuff. I'm starting to look into the marketing side now. I'm starting to work out, do I have anything that can give me the bills? You know, book report is a, being a bit rubbish at the moment. I'm starting to use Amazon, just their basic thing for the, for my numbers. Yeah. I've got Janet, the, I've got Janet Margot's book here. I'm constantly reading the, from that. So. The one I would suggest for that tool is look at Reader Links, or it's called the Author Helper Suite now. I've just joined it, funny enough. Okay, and very powerful tool. Not we want to turn this into a pitch for them, but <laughs> we could talk afterwards about them. But it's got no, a I, lot I'm of literally, stuff. I, about a week ago, I actually was told and I've, I've actually got it. Yeah. But it's that kind of, I'm writing a book right now. I'll yeah, yeah. That, that. Well, and it's one of these things that like most people are just scratching the surface of, right? And yeah. it's still, it, it does, that's very helpful. But like when you start doing some of these other, like I said, we can talk about how you should use it for your links and your books and it saves you time changing back. You never have to change back matter again. Yeah, I use Booklinker for a lot of my yeah. links anyway. So I'll use yeah. those. But to be honest, my biggest app for anybody who wants to be a writer is Notion. Because I have everything on one page, my Hooded Man page. I can have every single one of my books. I can show exactly where I am at any point. I'm a big one for lists. I like tick boxes. I have to know that I'm working my way through a phase. Because as well, I'm, I've am i written, I think it's like I've written some five five 550,000 words this year already. And I, there's a part of me that's like, I need to know that I'm not just, if I'm writing three 4,000 words a day, I'm only nibbling at that number. So there is an element of if I'm writing a book and I know it's going to take a month to two months. And again, it sounds like I'm writing it super fast and therefore it won't be that great. But you've also got to remember is while I'm writing, for example, I've just finished writing Steal the Gold, my second early reckless book. But in that time, I've also been plotting out my next D.I. Walsh book. Mm. So by the time I actually get into it, I'm ready to go. Bam, let's go. Done. I'm writing three comics as well at the same time. I'm doing something else over here. I've been planning out another book. Because I need to be bouncing on different things, because when I was a journalist, you never wrote one story. You were always, this is my story for this week's feature. I need something for next week's feature. I've got to make sure I'm going to be talking to these people over there. 
I can't just sit down and go 10,000 words a day. When this book is done, I'll move on to the next book. And again, yeah, it's think... also something good for anybody who wants to become a writer is learn to spin plates. Yeah. I, and I think that if you look at novelists that come out of journalism and the legal profession, there's just this different level of discipline around the act of writing that helps them perform better. Yeah. They're just used to writing in a different way. Sometimes you may, especially for lawyers, they have to start to, it sounds horrible, but dumb down their writing. Yeah. The, but, uh, the top indie writing crime novelist, in fact, actually, I think the top UK indie writer at the moment, which is LJ Ross, who has topped like the bookseller charts and stuff like that, ex-lawyer. Yeah, yeah, pretty common. So who are some of the people that you like look to to help you get better? Like we talked earlier before we got on the recording, we we're talking about how you, you mentioned a tennis player hiring Yvonne Lendl to improve their game. And we were talking about golf. and. I, I think always having a coach or a mentor is really yeah. helpful. Who, 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 do, whether it's books you read or people you're actually working with, who kind of it's who's, a, it's your, a tough who's one your mentor? Because obviously, I came when I came into writing as Jack Gatland, I was 50 years old. So I'm 52 now. I was 50 at the time. I'd been writing at this point about 33 years. I'd been writing at stuff. So at this point, I was actually mentoring people and writing comics and stuff like that. When I came into writing books, I was in a completely weird position where i'm a new york times best-selling author and i'm going to people how do i do this it's that kind of thing yeah. so my dog has come to say hello go away i'm in the middle of an interview she's like, i want food yeah. uh, but for me it is weird because as i said basically i've spent most of my life over half my life as a freelance writer as a writer of film and tv and stuff like that and in the last two years becoming jack gatlin my life has completely changed i've become a mid six-figure author just by doing almost effectively going against every rule I learned in the years that I was doing it. I had a book agent, James Wills, who was a lovely guy who I actually ended up turning around and saying, I can't use you anymore because every piece of information you've given me, every piece of advice you've given me, I've gone against and now I'm doing better. And in fact, he's now working with translations with me, but there was an element of looking at this and going, I, I don't want to be this person. I'm going against everything I've done. It's a bit icky. Yeah. So now in a situation, I'm in a situation where I have to look at it and go, what areas do I not know? And this is the thing we were saying. Yeah, Andy Murray, great tennis player, greatest in England, couldn't win Wimbledon, takes Ivan Lendl. Ivan Lendl looks at him and obviously tells him something that gives him that edge. And as you said, Tiger Woods has a putting coach, even though he's like one of the best in the world, because there's always something you can learn. Yeah. So for me, there was an element of... There's a term I was always told, which is basically, you never want to be the smartest person in the room. Mm. because if you're in the smartest person in the room, you can't learn anything. That's a good point. You want to get out of that room. That room is no longer good for you unless you've got mm -hmm. an ego problem. <laughs> you should genuinely, if you want, yeah. if, if Trump, for example, is the smartest person in the room as far as he's concerned. He likes to be full of yeah. people who look up to him. Yeah. Elon Musk is a similar person. Yeah. I don't want to be that. I want to be somebody who's in the room with the cleverer people because I want to be able to ask, so how do I do this? How does this work? For me, this is one of the reasons why 20 books is amazing. 20 books to 50K, the Facebook page, you have everybody on there from people who have just started and have made their first dollar up to people who have made a million this month. And every single person will give advice. And some of it's wrong for you, some of it's right for you, but you can distill. So I like to surround myself by with clever people. I'll find people who are good at what they do. I mean, several masterclasses, which basically what I mean by that is it's groups of people who are on a set level who have made Facebook groups up and we'll sit and we'll go through it. I'm on the 20 books masterclass thing. So I can mm -hmm. chat with Amazon and stuff like that, which again, I sit in a room with these people and go, so explain to me exactly how this works. I can, I've got people I can contact where I go, I don't understand how Facebook ads work. What am I doing wrong? I have people I can speak to when I say, my cover looks shit. Why am I getting this wrong? Yeah. And with story, it's more of a self-help group sort of thing. There's more people around that I can go, oh my God, I really can't focus on this today. And people will be going, have you tried this? Have you tried that? I'm very much into biohacking. So I'm into a lot of nootropics and stuff like that. So I'll look at what nootropic stacks I'm taking. How do I focus in the mornings? And then I'll talk to someone like, say, Jacob Tanner, who's also into that kind of thing. And we'll be like, we'll sit down and go, what are you taking? How are you working that through? 
And that's more what I do. I'm not going to people and saying, will you mentor me? What I'm saying to people is, I need some assistance on this particular thing. And what I always found when I wrote was nine times out of 10, I'll sit down with somebody and I already know the answer. But I need somebody to help me to get to that answer. And most of the time, somebody's had that same problem. They can give me something that makes me go, oh, my God, that's I can't believe I didn't even think of that. Yeah, but for sure. The main person I have is my dog, who's just down there now staring at me. <laughs> because, And I'm genuine because I'll walk her. I'll go for a walk with her. I'll just turn my brain off. I don't listen to books. I don't listen to music. I just walk somewhere like Woodlands for a good mile. And I just focus on the problem. What mm. is the issue I've got here? Why can't this scene work? What is going wrong? And it's in my head or it's just I'm picking up things from the years I've written or the years I've watched TV or film or a scene will come into my head and I'll go, oh, that would work. But it's, if I wasn't walking my dog, I wouldn't have that. No, I hear you. There's that time you need just for that creative space to open up and yeah. all those weird ideas from things from five minutes ago to things that are 20 years old come together and make something that is new and magical. <laughs> yeah. And it's there's an openness to finding things at work. So, for example, mm -hmm. I'm writing a book at the moment, a Mur Murder by Mistletoe. It's my Christmas story. Someone is killing people dressed like Father Christmas. It's, it's, a, lovely, it's a lovely, happy yeah. Christmas story. <laughs> But I couldn't work out what the connective tissue was. There was nothing I could get it through. And I went to a talk on Saturday and someone was talking about the, the clubs of London and the old gentlemen's clubs, like the yeah, top yeah, old no, no. ones. And then instantly I went, I've used these clubs in previous books, but never done much with them. And suddenly I now know how to do it and also bring in a popular character. But if I hadn't gone to that talk, I wouldn't have known. Mm. And all yeah. it takes is just being able to just listen, take that moment write it the hell down before you forget it and then just put it into story and again if you're writing backwards like i do you can start putting those scenes in before you even start writing the book because you know you're going to get to those scenes interesting yeah no that's cool and i think it's freeing right like that you don't have to feel like you have to have it figured out to begin with it's that iterative process that works doesn't matter if you're a plotter or a pantser like you just keep going around the loop. Until it is freeing, but sometimes it's utterly terrifying because there will be times, and I've had them in books, where I've written myself into corners and I'm walking around going, I don't know how to fix this. This will mm. not work. I do not know how the hell I'm going to do it. And then something will happen. Or I'm, there's been several times I've just gone back and gone, I'm just deleting this entire chapter and starting again. Yeah. Because this chapter hasn't, I've gone down the wrong alleyway. Mm. So let's come back out onto the road and carry on down the road. And sometimes that's all it takes. Never be afraid to delete yourself because if you've got different drafts, you'll always have it. Never be afraid to edit yourself. Never be afraid to change your mind. Never be afraid to literally decide that your ending is rubbish and you can do something different. Because if you're not writing it linearly, you can do what you want. The only time your book is going to be even looked at in a linear fashion is when the first reader picks it up and reads it. Yeah, you never have point. to write it. If you can't focus on the scene you're writing, go write a fun scene. It will mm. be 50,000 words further on in the book, but it's still 3,000 words of your book that you've written, which has pushed you towards your target. Which gets to the whole production piece. Yeah, and you so might like, find yeah. as you're writing that scene that actually you've worked it out. And this is something else I would say. Is when I, I said at the early, at early on that when I was younger, I was at Covent Garden and then I was paralysed. I had an accident which basically shard my spine and mm. couldn't walk for a while but i also lost three months of my memory mm. and i've never got it back but i was writing a book and i had handwritten notes of this book and when i looked at it i realized it was a sequel to a book i'd written while i was in this three months that i can't remember like a short <laughs> story but looking at it it didn't matter because I could look at the sequel and go, I know what must have happened in the first book because I'm working it through. And that's why I work right the way I am. Because if you write a later scene with utter conviction of this is what has happened, the earlier scenes will have to conform to that moment. Your brain will make sure they do. Interesting. Cool. Tony, it's been great having you on and learning more about this process i hope um, i haven't waffled too much no it's great and so you're going to be at 20 books so folks that watch this that are they're going to be at the convention you got one or two 
I have two. Basically, the two talks that I did in Madrid, I've been asked to do again. So one of my talks is about creating characters and subplots, mainly talking about how the best way to, to work them through, sub supporting characters and subplots, sorry. And then the other one is effectively Chekhov's gun and how working backwards can help you move forward. I think one of them is very early in the morning, one's in the afternoon. Yeah, and I, for anybody that's watching this, go and see these. If you're trying to think about how you can really step up your writing process and get more creative, I found them really interesting. Thank you very much. Enough so to have you on the show. You may be our first craft guy. Hopefully I've set the bar low enough. For <laughs> you just step right over and come in. Um, <laughs> What's that on the floor? Oh, no. And like we, we had talked about earlier, I think that this not, I certainly have no, no input on craft. That's not my thing. But I think that as authors start thinking about the reality of it is that quality is evaluated by the reader only when they read your book. That experience of reading, that daydream in front of the mind's eye that you've directed for them is the experience you're selling. It's not a book. It's not an audio book. It's that experience. And the better you make that, the more people will come and drink your lemonade. Absolutely. And I, sugar in it, they're not going to drink it. Exactly. And anybody who wants to write a book, and I've always said this to them, and this was comics or film or whatever, is it's you shouldn't come into writing a book expecting to write the next book a prize winner or something like that. Write the book that you want to write, that you think that you would mm. enjoy reading. Because the chances are if you enjoy reading it, then others will. But also, it will take the pressure off you to write that best-selling book. I didn't write any of my books expecting them to be bestsellers. I didn't write my books expecting myself to be where I am now. Mm. I wrote them because I was going crazy, not doing anything in the pandemic. And I was happy just to make my salary or have something in the background that would just keep going in the background while I did everything else. Mm. As it is, it's become my life because Hooded Man Media, which I started to do these, is now I've done a couple of other people. I'm working in other areas. We're now doing graphic novels. Mm. All of this came from one thing. And if I'd have sat down at the start and thought, I'm going to be doing this big, amazing thing, it would have just brought me into a tiny ball and I wouldn't mm. have done it. Do what you're cool. comfortable with. Write what you're comfortable with. And also, don't be afraid to write rubbish stuff because <laughs> you can always do a second draft or a third draft. And it's only when that person reads it for the first time that you know they don't know how many years you took to write this. And it's as simple as that. And also, the one thing I will say, and this is a big thing, and I'm sorry to interrupt at the very end. One thing I get, and I got this a lot in Madrid, was people going, I would love to rapid release, but if I'm rapid releasing, I'm not writing quality work mm, because no. I'm rushing my work. And the one thing I want to say to anybody who does that, a few years ago, I went to the Richard Lansing Green Lecture at the Sherlock Holmes Society where Sir Christopher Frayling had found Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's diary of the time he was writing The Hound of the Baskervilles, possibly one of the greatest detective stories of all time and definitely one of the best Sherlock Holmes stories of all time. And he worked out through reading this book that he reckoned that Arthur Conan Doyle wrote that entire book in 17 days while also playing five games of cricket. <laughs> it doesn't matter how long it takes yeah. as long as the story is there. Yeah, Charles yeah. Dickens used to write serialized stories for magazines. So did Conan Doyle. They were the yeah. equivalent of Penny Dreadfuls. Yeah, you they had cannot, to. That's how you made money. Yeah, you cannot judge a book by the speed it's written. No. Especially if you buy a journalist. Yeah, I think that let the market sort it out is my take on that. The ones that get hung up on that are authors. You want to yeah. take 20 years to write your book? God bless, go do it. There might be... And I'm not saying that you can't do that. I'm just saying, well, don't think that just because someone writes fast, they're not writing because that's not how it works. Because you could just look at anybody who writes comics at the moment. They don't get more than a couple of weeks top. And I think that when you look at my client base, there's even the ones that maybe aren't releasing as much just because of how their lifestyle is, they're still mm. fast writers. They'll still write a book and start to finish in less than six weeks. Because when they get in that, they're in the story world and they're plotting it out and they're doing oh, yeah. like that's what those blinkers are on you yeah. are just yeah. yeah yeah great so before we wrap up 
where can people find you? Shamelessly plug your stuff. And then we'll call it a day. <laughs> on social media, I am on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, all as Mr. Tony Lee, M-R-T-O-N-Y-L-E-E. -E. I'm also on all of them as Hooded Man Media, which is my company. And as Jack Gatland Books, which is my obviously other self, apart from Twitter, where it's Jack Gatland Book, because they wouldn't have enough letters to do what <laughs> I wanted to do. And yeah, I'm basically, you can find me on all those places. I'll be at 20 Books in Vegas. Come and say hi, because it's my first Vegas, and I don't know that many people. I'm only in for three days. I'm in and out. Apart from that, I will be talking at Rain Dance in December on Story. I'll be probably at the London Film and Comic Con in November. But just come find me online, say hi. Cool. All right, Tony. Thanks a lot. It's great having you on. Thank you for having me. All right. Talk to you later. Bye.